Kanako Inuki has to be one of the most underrated horror mangakas of all time. With all the talk of Junji Ito being the king of horror manga, Inuki would definitely have to be the queen. And one of our most popular collections, Be Very Afraid of Kanako Inuki, proves it. So today, let's take a deep dive into the series and see if Kanako Inuki is truly the queen of horror. But if you guys want to see more anime content like this one, then why not go down and hit that subscribe button. And thank you guys for voting on the poll, the video will be coming out at the end of May, so stay tuned for that. But without further ado, let's get into it. Kanako Inuki was born on November 28th, 1958. She was always interested in horror manga from before she could even read. Her mother would give her a monthly allowance to buy whatever manga she wanted. She never really thought about being a manga artist, but when she was working as a secretary, she continued her hobby of reading horror manga, and from that she began to draw her own manga, with the first published story being Ursuban back in 87. In the 90s, when the horror genre just started blowing up, she became one of the leading authors for magazines like Mystery House, Suspiria, and Suspense and Horror. However, most of her works haven't been published in America since School Zone back in 2006, until 2022 when Kodanshan released Be Very Afraid of Kanako Inuki, a collection of some of Inuki's six favorite short stories dating back to the 90s and early 2000s. So let's take a deep dive into each chapter and if they're even scary enough to earn her the title of Queen of Horror. Mayuko-chan and her classmates would celebrate everyone's birthday in their month, with all their friends giving them presents. There was a girl classmate that the class didn't like named Kurumi, who was born in the same birth month as Mayuko. The girls in the class decided to play a prank on her by not getting her any presents for her birthday. Decades go by and we see that Mayuko as an old lady, a couple of her co-workers gave her gifts to celebrate her birthday. She thanked them, but every birthday reminds her that she's just getting closer to death. She gets approached by a little girl who looks just like Kurimi-chan and starts acting awfully mean to her. The little girl notices her birthday present and warns her that the more birthday presents she gets, a year gets added to her age, and that she never had that problem because no one has ever given her a gift. It's at this point that she reveals herself to be Kurumi and runs away, leaving Mayuko scared to open up her own presents. Before every chapter, Inuki leaves a message for the audience to read. The message explains her thought process for making the story you're about to read. The story of the first chapter is very easy to understand. It's the fear of growing old. Even though there is no scary imagery or gore, the scariness comes in the concept of coming close to death. Inuki states that in Japan there's an old joke that all birthday presents come with the bonus of making you age one year. Some fun presents might actually be scary and some beautiful presents might actually be ugly. It's a great way to use psychological horror for a series that you didn't really expect for it to show up. Chapter 2 stars a 5 year old girl named Marimo. She's known for wanting to be older than she is, putting on makeup, trying out her mom's clothes, and chasing after boys. While getting rejected by a couple of boys at the park, she picked out another victim by the name of Bukita. They go on a date where they get to know each other and Marimo lets out that she wants to be grown up. So he took her to his house where he gave her a potion that is known to grow the user 10 years older in 7 days. The potion works and now she looks 15 but is still mentally 5 years old. We see Bukita get jealous every day and even try to protect her from the outside world. In the end though, she leaves the house and goes back to her old ways. However, instead of stopping the growth, she keeps on rapidly growing older and older to the point where she grows into an old woman and the kids at the park just start getting terrified of her. The final panel is Marimo as a skeleton asking kids if they want to play. This chapter plays with the concept of aging as well. Although it's not the fear of aging, it's the obsession of growing up. She's sexualized but from her own doing, it's way more tragic than it was in the last chapter. This chapter actually uses the scary imagery to its advantage. This is where the Junji Ito comparisons start to come in. While not as extremely detailed as his other works, it's as unsettling and creepy as most of his works, especially with the designs of the characters. They give a disturbing baby doll-like vibe to them. According to Inuki, one of the inspirations for this series was the horror film The Collector, which is about a stalker who is supposed to be known as scary and evil, 
but has come to be loved by the audience. And that inspired the creation of Bukita. The horror isn't from Bukita himself, but the tragedy of Marimo, and a warning to children who are eager to abandon their childhoods away, which is a theme that I feel like will show up again later on. The third chapter in this collection stars two siblings, Sasori being the older sister and the little sister, Sanagi. Sasori is known to be mean to her little sister, even breaking her toys. So on Christmas, Sanagi asks Santa for a toy that Sasori would never be able to break. The next morning, she gets a doll that looks just like Sasori. She tries to break its neck, but she starts feeling pain in her own neck. One day, Sanagi is walking down the street when a couple of bullies approach her and steal her doll. They try to take the skirt off the doll, but Sasori interrupts and protects her sisters from getting attacked by the bullies. The two sisters run away as Sanagi now likes her sister just a little bit. The chapter ends with Sasori putting a wrap around the doll so even if they take the clothes off, nothing will be exposed. The sisters go to sleep and Sasori is shown wrapped up in her own blanket. The short story was inspired by Inaki's real life as she is the oldest of her two sisters. However, out of all the stories in this collection, this is definitely one of my least favorites in both interest and scariness. The voodoo doll concept isn't really scary to me. There are no haunting images and the story can actually be pretty wholesome in a way. The story is fine, it's just I expected a little bit more horror. Chapter 4 starts with a little girl named Koiko visiting the doctor for some chest pains. This isn't the first time she's felt these pains as it happens whenever she thinks of a man that she's never met before. She was a very timid girl with a broken and abusive family which led her to have a fear of the opposite sex. Even though her dislike for boys grew stronger and stronger, she was still interested in love. However, she took to manga and novels to fulfill those emotions and her imagination has caused her to go insane. The doctor, Kanawa, while skeptical, plays on with the act, but the more she describes her encounters, the more real he seems. One day, she comes in excitedly saying she found out why she was having chest pains. She took off her shirt and reveals a big lump where her heart is. She proclaims that she heard his voice for the first time and that the man was right inside of her all along. At the hospital, a fetus-like figure is shown to be inside of her heart. And while the doctor tries to tell Koiko that the man she's been thinking about is not real, Something bursts through her chest and her heart flops on the ground. The man that she was talking about this whole time crawled out of her heart and immediately got eaten by her. This story is the most chilling and traumatic one of them all. The psychological and body horror reflects a lot like a Junji Ito story, especially at how strange and wild that the narrative can be. Koiki's obsession is self-destructive and caused by her fears and desires with them slowly growing in her heart, figuratively and literally. It can also be interpreted as how some fans become obsessed with fictional 2D characters, to the point where it becomes their whole life. It was Inuki's first time trying to adapt something supernatural. She wanted to do something different by giving a hero that would analyze his kids' supernatural phenomenons. If you have a wish you want fulfilled, you must capture a demon. When the bell tolls midnight on Friday the 13th, during a full moon, point two mirrors at each other, and a demon will cross the mirror's path. Then you must capture him with a small vase. Once the wish is fulfilled, the demon will vanish into dust. A blind princess was born with immediate praise from everyone. She learned to feel and listen in pure darkness, but she was always happy, until she grew up into a young lady who was told how beautiful she was over and over again. But she had no idea if it was even true, and she wanted to know. She got tired and depressed and even lashed out at everyone, even her own husband. She goes to the library to see if her wish can come true. A librarian showed her a book on how to capture a demon and make it grant her wish. So, on the full moon, on Friday the 13th, she captured a demon and made her wish to be able to see. It worked, and she was truly beautiful. However, that couldn't be said about everyone else around her. All the voices that she'd been hearing were disgusting monsters. The monsters adopted her as their princess and took care of her as their guiding light. As the reason that the monsters are so happy is because of the princess. But even though the monsters have taken care of her, the princess still can't manage to take a look at them. The story ends with her feeling guilty over how ugly her own heart has grown. 
Fulfilled Wishes was Inuki's first ongoing series, with each chapter being a story about demons getting involved in human lives. She was aiming for something more bizarre than actually scary, and it worked really well here. The story has a huge Kazuo Yumetsu influence, which is one of Inuki's favorite mangakas growing up, with a lot of the shouju art style mixed in with a lot of grotesque horror. Even though that the plot twist was pretty predictable, it still hit hard, especially around the ending of the story, when she feels really bad for treating the people that loved and took care of her in such a horrible way. The school year has started and a girl named Tatari is being bullied by her classmates. Kids would push her, ignore her, scream awful things at her, and even throw objects at her. And it's like that for the entire chapter. Except when a girl named Yochan stands up for Tatari. She was also lonely and didn't have any friends, so she felt really bad for Tatari. But the rest of the class didn't care and decided to bully both of them by throwing stuff and yelling at them. So badly to the point that Tatari begged Yochan to bully her just so she doesn't get her herself. Yochan's rage caused all of the classmates' fingernails to get chipped off. The rest of the school year passes by and no one bullies them as they remember the day of them getting their fingernails chipped off. Tatari and Yochan become best friends and they promise to gain even more friends in the next school year. Inuki wanted to help the horror genre gain more ground, so she wanted to make a series that developed deeper into people's hearts. Now out of all of the short stories in this collection, Friends at the Smiling Gate was the only one that made me feel generally uncomfortable. Not only because of the supernatural fingernail scene, which was also pretty hard to see, but just of how cruel the classmates can be with the bullying. It leads more into a realistic type of horror than supernatural, which is rarely done but executed well. Be Very Afraid of Kanako Inuki isn't just a collection of her best stories, but a big dive into her personal life. It's filled with little notes of each chapter and the top fives of her favorite stuff. At the end of the volume, the life story of Inuki is out there in the open with an interview from Kodansha. While Junji Ito uses supernatural gore and shock factor, Inuki mixes the paranormal with realism. Each chapter, while different, all share a common theme of social acceptance and expectations. Inuki uses the fear of social issues that would be found in females, mainly in young girls. With characters trying to be more mature by getting boyfriends or looking beautiful, Inuki suggests that while it is normal for young girls to feel this way, it's also a very unhealthy obsession that could lead to their downfall. Her art style supports this with every chapter having a baby doll-like character mixed with grotesque horror situations. As horror continues to evolve, it's really hard to ignore her contribution to the genre as well. She deserves all the recognition as not only a pivotal voice in horror, but as the queen of horror. But I want to say thank you guys for watching this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you want more videos like this, then why not go down and hit that subscribe button. And also, I'll be dropping the video with the winner of the anime poll. The winner is Steinsgate, so expect that video to be at the end of May. And I'll be seeing you guys in the next video.